So, uh, great to see everybody. Now, first of all, today is a two-part series. It's actually a three-part series. Uh, part one is going to be strictly education. We're just going to stick to PowerPoint, a very structured lesson for the first hour. Uh, then I, then uh, I think there's an hour break or something else in between, and then we're going to come back a little bit later, and we're going to start to apply this stuff, uh, first by applying it to short-term trading, and then we'll do another session, I think it's next week, applying what we're going to learn today on uh, long-term trading. All right? So, but very quickly, um, this session is all about, all these sessions are all about you, but I just want to take uh, uh, just a, a few seconds to just... Uh, Say thank you to FX Street and thank you to uh, to anybody uh, who who uh, voted for me for the uh, that uh, those awards that FX Street handed out. Uh, FX Street is is really moving mountains in the industry. Uh, you know where where would we be without uh, the FX Streets out there? Uh, just a great platform for for education and portal for for uh, everybody. But again, thanks again. And with the um, you know with the whole concept and everything that I do. Um, you know, make no mistake about it. I'm just, I'm simply the messenger. Uh, you know, I didn't create supply and demand. You know, Einstein didn't uh, doesn't own physics and and uh, you know and, and all the other guys out there. But um, you know, I'm just the messenger. And and my main my main pitch is that look, how you make money buying and selling anything out there is exactly what you need to be doing in the market. And uh, and that's what we're going to focus on today. If you if you're someone who can keep things simple, you have some discipline, and you can really just drown out all the noise out there that comes with today's information highway, especially in the world of trading and high-speed platforms and split-second news. You know, if you can kind of just forget about all that stuff and and go back to just how you make money buying and selling anything, I think you'll do okay. All right. Well, again, so thanks again. Appreciate it, and uh, let's move on. So again, today uh, the, the 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 key part that that I really want to make sure you get. Now we're going to focus on complete strategy today, but the biggest component of that is the ability to time the market's turning points in advance with a very high degree of accuracy. Okay, so so uh, you know before you start thinking, well, that sounds like we're going to learn, you know, try to pick tops and bottoms. We are going to try to pick tops and bottoms. Um, you know, don't don't be don't be afraid of that, and don't don't shy away from that because people frown on that. I mean, when you buy and sell things in other parts of your life, are you always trying to buy low and sell high? Why should it be any different here? The people that make the money, if you're losing money, okay, if you're in this session today and you're actually you know and you're losing money, believe me, the people that are taking your money are buying low and selling high, and you're on the other side of those trades. So let let's learn how to get on the right side of that equation today. All right. Now, again, I want to start, uh, just switch the slide here. So did you see me switch the slide, or do I have to capture that screen again, just so I know? Um, are you looking at a different slide now? And if you just tell me one time, I'll, I'll, uh, I won't have to ask you. Okay, so you saw, you're not looking at a new slide. Okay, so I'll capture, every time I switch the slide, I'll capture it, then I guess I have to do that. There you go, there's the next slide. Thanks for that. So uh, the only point of showing you this, uh, this is from today. Made about a thousand dollars this morning in a very short-term trade in the Aussie dollar, Aussie US. And I just want to let you know that if you really pay attention to what we're going to go over here today, both in the lesson and then uh, trading application a little bit later on, uh, my goal is to make sure that you walk away from these sessions having a very solid understanding of how to do this. Okay, uh, this is all real money trading that I'm showing you. These aren't demo accounts or hypothetical returns. This was just little short-term trading off a little two and five minute Aussie dollar chart. I'd say about, uh, I don't know, two, three hours ago. All right? So I want to make sure uh, that you understand that. The goal here is that you can walk away from this stuff uh, having a very solid understanding of how to do just this. All right, let's move on. Okay, I'll capture the chart again. Now that trade was taken in the Aussie futures, okay? Most of the trades, uh, trade examples here that you're going to see are taken in the currency futures. So that was global futures, Mike. Okay, that was global futures platform. All right. Short-term trading, uh, everything I do in the forex market is in, in, the, in the futures. But you know, it doesn't matter if you don't trade futures. It, it doesn't matter. It's the same market, same chart. Okay. It doesn't. It's not like one 
It's not like the futures are moving up and the forex is moving down. It's, it's, it's the same market. All right, so take a look. You can see the next screen here. And, again, in order for you to, to really grasp the concept and get the strategy, here, here's a big problem in the world of trading education. People are presented with a chart and a pattern and, and told, okay, this pattern works 80% of the time. Let's memorize the pattern. Now go trade. Okay. The problem is everybody skips the most important part with that. It's understanding the logic behind it. Because if you thought the logic behind just about every conventional technical analysis pattern or setup out there, you wouldn't even care about the pattern because you'd realize it doesn't work. It can't work. It's flawed. So let's spend a few minutes getting your mind in the right spot. Let's get your mind in the right place to be able to absorb the strategy and information properly. And, and at the same time, we're going to be learning all the way. So really ask yourself, uh, let's focus on the picture on the left. You know, how many, how many people, uh, you know, there's, there's a chart on the left, and uh, we've got some indicators, some oscillators, okay? Yeah, SW, we're going to, by the way, you know, anybody that's been through one of my education sessions here, today we're taking things a lot deeper. I mean, this is a full-blown three-part series, so uh, we're going to cover things we've never covered before, all right, including profit, target, uh, profit targets, okay? And we'll go over that Aussie trade as well, SW. So take a look at the chart on the left. Uh, a lot of people probably have, uh, you know, maybe people have charts that look like that, loaded with indicators and oscillators. There's some pivot points. There's so much stuff on the screen, you can barely see the candles, right? But I've also listed just a few of many conventional chart patterns, indicators, oscillators, news-type things uh, on the bottom. And we could add a few hundred more to that list. But if you really look at that chart and look at some of the stuff below, and, and you know, some of those items below the chart, you know, have been in trading books, you know, for the last, I don't know, 100 years or so. But really be honest with yourself here and ask yourself, you know, who really makes money? In other words, do you know anybody that makes a consistent living using that stuff that you see there on the left? Because this is the stuff that dominates the trading education world. This is the stuff that dominates the trading books. And uh, But when you ask yourself, you know, how many people do you know that make a consistent living using that stuff? There's probably not many. And for most of you, it's probably zero, right? Now, now I, I'm comfortable asking that question because I already know the answer. I've been in, I've been in, I've been in the trading world for, for long enough uh, to understand how this stuff works. Now, let's take a look on the right. How about that group? Do they make money? What about that group on the right there? How do, how do they do when it comes to profits? They're probably one of the best out there, right? Okay, they, they do they do pretty well. Um, in fact, they make more money, you know, than than most countries probably print, right? What's their big secret, right? What what do they do? Um, yeah, you know, what's what's their big secret? They buy at wholesale prices and they sell at retail prices. You know, they buy the plastic for twenty five cents, they sell it to us for a dollar, and we are more than thrilled to pay for that. Have you ever been to a Walmart at I don't know, 8 o'clock in the morning, noon, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, 8 o'clock at night, 10 o'clock at night, right? Is the parking lot ever not full? You ever go to a Walmart, you know, at like 10 o'clock at night and, and try to get a good parking space? Okay? You, you understand what I'm saying? All right. So what we're going to do here, now, uh, the, the main point here is, now, now it's not fun and, and not like, you know, it, it, it doesn't sound great. To, to say, hey, I want to be like Walmart, right? Because, you know, most people don't. Uh, it's not the highest end, you know, logo and, uh, and tag out there, right? So it's not fun to talk like that. But trust me, in the trading world, you want to be Walmart. I am proud to say that, that, uh, that, that I try to do exactly what Walmart does. In the trading world, I am proud to want to be like Walmart when it comes to trading, all right? And that's all we're going to learn how to do, Okay. So you have to think in those terms, and you have to really just kind of forget about all that stuff on the left, just for a little bit, right? So to get this market timing um, concept to you, let me grab the next chart here. Again, for those who came in late, okay, for those who came in late, the first hour is all education. We're going we're gonna, gonna to shove this uh, logic and strategy down your throat for the next hour. Then we're going to come back and do a trading session later on and start to apply these things, okay? Yeah, Nick, uh, a, a lot of the time I do. So to get this market timing concept to you, 
and make sure you understand that we're going to focus on two key things here. Now, I run, uh, I run the trading rooms, the XLT program, we call it, an online trading academy. And uh, I can tell you in the, in the Forex XLT, the Forex trading room, we, um, we have uh, lessons in there. Okay? Now, what I did here was I pulled part of that lesson out, and, and I want to share it with you here. Okay? To get this market timing concept across to you, to make sure that you can understand how to predict where the market's going to turn in advance with a very high degree of accuracy, we're going to focus on two key points here. Number one, uh, where do prices turn? Now, now, why is that important? Well, again, the whole concept of market timing is, timing is important because if you want the ability to attain the low risk, high reward, and high probability entry point into any market, any time frame, you absolutely need to know where the market's going to turn before it turns. Okay? Now, you're not going to catch every turn in price, but the significant turns, we should be able to see those coming in advance with a very high degree of accuracy. Okay? So how does it all work? Well, if you've listened to anything I've said over, over the last uh, couple of years, you understand that the movement of price in any and all markets is, sim is simply a function of this ongoing supply and demand equation, okay? which means opportunity exists when this simple ex and straightforward equation is out of balance. Right? Uh, if you understand that, then you'll understand that the most significant turns in price right, happen at price levels, again, where supply and demand is out of balance. So the only question left is, what exactly does that picture look like on a price chart? Okay, that's the picture we need to learn how to identify. And we're going to do that in just a couple minutes. Right? Uh, so, so where did I, you know, where did I kind of get, get, uh, get that? Where, did, where does this come from as far as, as, far as me and, and my trading goes? Well, I started my career on the floor of the Chicago Mercantile Exchange, actually in the currencies. Uh, you know, years ago, handling institutional order flow. That was my job in the beginning. All right? I would, uh, I would take orders from institutions, banks, money managers, hedge funds, you name it, even some retail traders, and I, you know, uh, my job would be to facilitate those orders. Right? So what I would do is every day I'd get down to the floor. Now really hear me out with this, because as we get to the charts, the story I think is really going to help you. Okay? Try to visualize this stuff. So I'd get down to the floor about an hour before the markets would get going, and uh, I'd be answering those phones, taking those orders, and about 15 minutes, I'd say, before the markets would really get going, I'd stop answering the phones because I, because I had this big, unorganized mess of paper in front of me back then, right? No different than today. It's just today's everything's screen-based. Same, same, same thing, though. Uh, today is just better because the numbers are bigger. But anyway, so I'd stack those orders. I'd, put, I'd create piles of orders all according to price. So each stack of orders is the same price. I put the buy orders to my left, the sell orders over to my right, and off we would go. Okay? But make no mistake about it. If I wanted to know where the market was going to stop falling and begin to turn higher, all I'd have to do is look down into my left and find the larger stack of buy orders below current price. That was the market's real demand. If I wanted to look down, uh, if I wanted to know where the market was going to stop rallying and begin to turn lower, all I'd have to do is look down into my right and find the largest stack of sell orders above current price. That was the market's real supply. Okay. As W, whose orders were they? These were orders from banks, institutions, money managers, hedge funds, right? I was, that was one of the biggest trading desks at the time. Okay. Now, um, one thing that's very important for you to understand is uh, you, may be look, you may be hearing this thinking, well, I know what he's talking about, because I, I, uh, I look at the matrix. You know, I see all the bids and offers coming in and things like that. Well, um, I would argue that those things aren't real, okay? Uh, you know, how often is it that you see a bid, the bid much bigger than the offer, but prices fall? Or the offer, ten times the size of the bid, and prices rally, right? It's because those orders aren't real. The intention, the real intention of those orders is not for them to be filled, it's to disguise real intentions. Let's talk about the orders I was dealing with on the trading, on the trading floor, right? First of all, the, the, you know, one of the reasons why I know that they were real is because most of the time those orders didn't get pulled. They were there to stay, okay? People didn't call up often and say, hey, pull that order. They were there to stick. But uh, the biggest reasons why I knew that, that that was real demand and real supply in the market is because I was not allowed to trade my own account. It was illegal, Okay. Uh, you could not trade your own account. I had to sign papers saying I wouldn't trade my own account and my family wouldn't and all this stuff. Why? Because these were real buy and sell orders. Okay. Um, second reason, 
Okay. Not only could I not trade my own account, um, but there were like cameras pointed at you from every direction. Uh, every phone call you made was recorded, and often there was a third party on the line listening to you. Why was the security so tight? Because those were real buy and sell orders. All right. So we're going to learn to see what that looks like on a price chart. We're going to identify exactly what those real willing buyers and sellers look like on a chart. Again, just a couple minutes. Number two, you need to start thinking about who is on the other side of your trade. It's such an important thing to do. Okay? A lot of people don't think about this or even consider it until you make them aware of it. But it's so important. Okay. Um, so my uh, uh, the goal here... Okay. The goal here is to make sure that there is a novice trader on the other side of your trade. Okay. I mean, wouldn't it be nice? Okay. Wouldn't that be nice if, if if every time you push the button, you knew that there was a consistent losing trader on the other side of your trades? Okay. Uh, that's the goal. Right. Let me let me uh, just make sure I'm not missing any questions. And we'll probably you know I'm trying to get all these questions at the end. And, and you know most of your questions, just so you know, not not I don't want to discourage you from asking questions. But just understand that most of them will probably be answered during the, the uh, presentation here. Uh, but let me uh, let me skip back here for a second. Okay. Uh, sure, they were there, you know, usually until they got filled. You know, def most of them were definitely there for the day. Okay. Uh, trade daily, yeah, there was there was huge orders, and these are a lot of these are multi-million dollar positions, right? At the time, all right. Okay, no problem. So number two, who's on the other side of your trade? Again, uh, every time you push the button, there's a there's a there's someone on the other side of that transaction trying to take your money. Okay. Now, ideally, we want to make sure that we are trading with novice market speculators. All right. How do you know the difference? Now, let me ask you here: How many people? There's 148 people in here. Um, how many people can can really spot a novice trader on a chart? Okay. How many people can spot a novice trader on a chart? And you can answer that if you want to. I mean, looking at a chart, you can put your finger on it and say, that is a novice buyer or that is a novice seller. How many people can do that in our group here today? Haley saying that they just look in the mirror, that was pretty funny. Thanks for that humor. Okay. That was good. All right, so as you can see, now I want you to look at the chat. Not many people said they can do it, right? So here's my next question. If you, cannot, if you cannot spot the novice trader on a chart, who do you think that novice trader is? Okay, You get the point? So I would not put another dime of money at risk in the market, of your hard-earned money at risk in the market, until you know exactly what a novice trader looks like in the chart. Because if, if you can't spot that novice trader... It might just be you, exactly like poker, Mike. If you don't, if you sit down at the poker table and you can't identify quickly who's going to pay the table that night, it's probably you. All right. Anyway, so we're going to learn two things here. Number one, to, to identify those price levels on a chart where supply and demand is out of balance, and number two, uh, exactly what that novice trader looks like on a chart. Let's do that now. Okay. And again, I'm starting out. You know, some of you that, that have been with us for a while, um, this may be a review for you. But well, trust me, we're going to take this stuff along the things that we've never gone into uh, before. We're going to do that during this session. We'll do it during the next session in a few hours here. And uh, let's keep going. Okay? So now let's start to identify those two things on the chart. And then we'll take it deeper, deeper, adding these things called odds enhancers. Number one, where and why do market prices change direction? Let's learn to identify those supply and demand levels. So I'm pointing to the chart here. You should be able to see that. Let's focus on this area right here, okay? Uh, here, prices are trading sideways. Supply and demand appear, appears to be in balance, okay? Uh, you know, price isn't moving up or down that much. It's just moving sideways. But all of a sudden, there's a strong drop in price. Now, a lot of people will look at this drop in price and say, ooh, I can't wait to learn how to predict that that's going to happen. Or, you know, I can't wait to learn how to get paid when this prices drop like this and make money in that. That's not what we do. We don't do either of those two things. Instead, we sit back nice and relaxed, and we let prices drop away from that level. When they do, we understand that the only reason why prices drop away from this level as they do is because supply and demand are very much out of balance at the origin of that drop. Okay? Um, in other words, again, the only reason why prices drop as they do here is because there's way too much supply up here, no demand, and uh, you know, when that, anytime that equation happens, prices are going to fall. 
So think about the trade desk. We want to know where that big stack of sell orders is, right? I mean, if you know where the real buyers and sellers are in the market, you know, can you lose money, right? You have to do something really foolish to lose, right? Okay. So um, this is that big stack of sell orders on the trade desk right here. What we're going to learn to do here, and we'll do this more, than, more in the second session, is we're going to learn to wrap two lines around this level based on a very specific set of rules. And we're going to carry this level forward, creating that sell zone or supply zone. We want to remember where the sellers are, all right? Down at the bottom, just the opposite is true. Prices are trading sideways. All of a sudden, there's a strong rally in price, okay? Again, once this rally happens and we let it happen, that's when we can say, aha, we now know where willing demand exceeds willing supply, where the real buyers are in this market, okay? So, again, we learn to... Uh, uh, you know, we're, we're gonna we wrap two lines around this level, carry this level forward, creating that buy zone or demand zone. Now, how can I speak so strong about that level? How can I say you know demand exceeds supply there with with such confidence? Because think about it, if that statement was not true, okay, prices uh, wouldn't prices just keep trading sideways here? If there was if there was equilibrium or balance, right, they would, but uh, but they didn't. They rallied away. Why? Because demand exceeds supply there, right? Uh, let's see here. Uh, Baston, I see we were saying the stack borders might disappear. Um, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that, that that's uh, something. The, the most important thing there is, you know, there there'll be people that say, you know, that say, well, oh, you know, that support level didn't hold, or that, you know, prices blew through this level or that level. Um, what happens is, it, you know, the de the definite, you know, what's you, what's your? I'm not talking about you, but you know, what's that person's definition of support resistance? Because you know, my definition of support resistance is going to be very different from someone else's, and that person's is going to be very different from yours. So, um, yeah, prices go through areas all day, um, but for, for me, they go through areas that I would expect them to go through. I, I will tell you that, again, this is just my opinion, but one of the most dangerous things in the whole world of trading education is conventional support resistance uh, stuff, okay? Um, how... All the trading books out there draw support resistance lines, to me, makes absolutely no sense. It forces traders to take, uh, well, the short way to say it is it forces you to jump into losing trades, quick losing trades, if you, if you really follow the rules of conventional technical analysis, okay? So, um, you should have sound. Everybody should have sound. Okay. Uh, but I Anyway, so we're, what we're here is really defining what supply, demand, support resistance is uh, for us, okay? So, so far we've learned to identify supply and demand levels on the chart. Let's move to step number two, and then we'll take this stuff a lot deeper. Uh, step number two, understanding who is on, on the other side of our trades, okay? All right. Uh, John Calloway, Calloway it, it could be, okay? Not always, but it could be. So let's deal with step number two. Let's learn to identify that novice trader, that novice market speculator on a chart. The good news is they're very easy to identify because they always make two obvious mistakes. Um, now, why would, you, why would they make these obvious mistakes? Because they don't know they're making them. If they did, they wouldn't do it, right? So let's take a look right here, okay, the area I'm pointing at. And let's, this area right here, let's specifically focus on the buyers, all right? Here, these buyers are those novice uh, market speculators. How do we know? Um, they're making those two mistakes. Mistake number one that these buyers are making, they're buying after a rally in price. Okay? Uh, not a smart thing to do to buy after a rally in price. You would never do that in any other part of your life and be consistently profitable doing it. Think of your favorite restaurant and think of, the, think of the, uh, your favorite you know, meal that you order at that restaurant. Uh, no matter how good that food is, when the server comes and brings your check, uh, whatever it is, do you ever offer to pay more? You know, if it's if it's if it's uh, if it's forty dollars, do you ever offer to, uh, to pay like sixty or seventy because you like the food so much? You know, when you buy a house, do you, do you ever offer more than the asking price? You know, of course not. You would never do those things. So why in the world, when people come to trading, do they do that here? Okay, that's exactly what they do. Not a smart thing to do. Okay. Yeah, we're going to cover. I'm looking at some of the questions there. I'm trying to uh, try. I'm trying to get to all of them, but uh, I promise you, we're going to get to. You're, all a lot of those questions are going to be answered during this session. Okay, but I'll, I'll definitely scroll back. All right. 
So um, anyway, mistake number two, these buyers are buying right into a price level over here where we've already identified supply exceeds demand. Okay, So think about it. Someone buying after a rally in price and buying into a price level where supply exceeds demand, what are the chances that this buyer is going to make money in that trade? Right? Think of the basic laws of supply and demand. They're buying after a rally price into a price level where supply exceeds demand. The laws of supply and demand guarantee that they're going to lose consistently. Maybe not every time, but consistently. Okay? All right? Um, so, instead of being that novice buyer, we want to be the seller. All right? Prices then fall. And uh, down here, if we specifically focus on the sellers, again, it's that same group of traders. Only here, they're selling after a drop in price. Mistake number one. Selling into a price level where demand exceeds supply. Mistake number two. Okay, instead of being that novice seller who's selling because of these scary red candles or you know the bad news, we want to be the buyer specifically right here at this black line with a protective sell stop just below the area. Buying right here, according to our rules, okay, is the lowest risk, highest reward, and highest probability time to buy into this market. Okay? Now. If you've ever read the trading books, okay, the books say don't buy here. Okay, they all warn you against buying here. They say don't buy right here where I'm telling you to buy. They say, uh, you know, wait for confirmation. Wait for confirmation of a green candle, right? Don't buy here because you don't know that there's buyers left. Let let the market show you that there's buy, or buyers here. Wait for a green candle. But if we wait for this green candle to form and then buy, what's now happened to our risk? Has it gone up or down? All right, what's happened to our risk? It's gone up. Yeah, what's happened to our reward or profit? In fact, our risk has almost doubled. Now, what's happened to our reward or profit margin? Yeah, exactly. Uh, that's gone That's gone down, too. Or that's gone down, right? Okay, yeah. So, uh, now, if you were to, it, it, you know, how would those two things uh, work for you in a business or in a company? You know, would you ever be successful in a, in a company doing that? Of course not, all right? And what we're talking about here today, by the way, any time frame, any market, you apply it equally. So uh, what we've learned so far, we're going to get to the charts in just a minute and take this deeper. We're going to identify supply and demand. And we've learned to identify what the novice buyer and novice seller look like on a chart. Now, uh, we so in other words, we're we're selling short on the first retest, not the second, the first retest test of a level, and we're buying on the first retest of a demand level. Okay, because until prices move away from these areas, how do we know what the real supply and demand equation is there? You don't. You can guess, but why guess? The chart will tell you. The price action will tell you. So once 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 the price moves away from these areas, we want to get in on the first pullback to these areas, but not just any areas. We're going to really define this as we go along this morning. All right. So let me just take a, take a moment here um, to just kind of tell you, you know, um, you know, the consistently profitable trader, or I should say, like you know, like the average Wall Street firm has it very easy or the average you know uh, uh the, you know the, the good uh, the, the good you know forex dealer desk what have you they have it very 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 easy in fact they're laughing all the way to the bank okay they're they're uh they're laughing all the way to the bank um, no you absolutely don't risk 100 percent on the trade yeah not every trade is going to work baston but once we get through the odds enhancers you should be able to identify the key market turning points. Uh, yeah, we'll get into that in just a little bit. Okay, so so again, you know, the, the, the consistently profitable trader has it very very easy. Again, laughing all the way to the bank. Think of it this way: compare the average trader or investor's returns around the world to the average, say, Wall Street firm's returns. Okay, uh, to the average Wall Street firm's returns. We'd probably all agree that it's a pretty lopsided equation, right? Right. One group's making all the money; the other group's barely making anything. Okay. Have you also ever noticed that, you know, what would you say? How many, what's the percentage of people that lose money trading? I, I, you know, I really don't know what it is. I, and I don't think anybody knows exactly. Is it 80, 90% of people that try this lose money? 95% like you're saying, right? Okay. But what about that other 5 to 10%? Are they just making a living or are they making a killing? Now, what, what would you say? Right? Are they just making a living or are they, make, are, they, are they doing pretty well? Yeah, they're making a lot of money. So do you ever wonder why that is? Why is it that the majority of people get this wrong, but the very few that get it right make a fortune? Okay, it's because 
uh, of this. Now, think of that average trader that we just well, – let me ask you this. What does that average trader or investor around the world do that we, you know, that we agree doesn't do very well? What do they do? They buy stocks, right? I'm talking about the average person buys stocks, right? Now, what is, what, is the, what is Wall Street's primary business? What is a Wall Street firm's primary business? What's, what's their primary business? Selling stock, exactly, exactly, right? So one group's buying stock, the other group's selling stock, and the sellers are making all the money, okay? Now, I'm not at all suggesting that we should stop buying stocks and start selling stocks. What I'm strongly suggesting, we're going to get into now, is that you need to start thinking uh, like that second group because they are laughing all the way to the bank. It's so easy for them, and here's why it's easy, okay? What does that average trader or investor do? And I'm talking about you, and I'm talking about me. What were we all trained to do from a very young age? Now, take yourself back to grade school, high school, university, grad school, and it gets even worse if you read the training books. And I'm including myself in that. I remember how I was taught all this from an early age. What do we need to do before, let's say, we buy a stock, for example, right? We have to make sure it's a good company with strong management, with a healthy balance sheet, right? What about earnings? They have to be really, really good earnings for the company, right? Okay. And what about the trend of the price of the stock? Does it need to be in an uptrend or a downtrend before we buy it? What about the trend of the price of the stock? Does it need to be in an uptrend or a downtrend before we buy it? It's got to be in an uptrend. That's like the golden rule. Well, let me ask you something. Where do you think the price of the stock is when all those things are true? You think it's ever down here at, at, at demand levels? Of course not. It's always right here, okay? Everybody, including myself, is so conditioned to do this exactly opposite of what we should be doing. People aren't, don't even, aren't even aware of how strong that conditioning is, okay? Now, instead of calling this a supply level on the chart, instead of calling this a demand level, let's, we can, well, there's other words we can use that are even more appropriate. Demand is really what? Wholesale prices, okay? Instead of calling this supply, call it retail. Okay, buy it wholesale, sell it retail. The Wall Street firm, the the the, the successful you know forex uh, bank or dealer desk, um, the consistently profitable trader is simply buying at wholesale prices, demand levels, and selling at retail levels, supply levels. What is the average person out there trained to do? And think it, again, think remember back when you were in school and think about every trading book you've ever read, right? You're, you're, the average person is conditioned and trained to buy at retail levels and sell at wholesale levels, okay? Exactly, Haley. There's a guy that's got it right, right? Now, that guy didn't just make a living, okay? What, does Warren Buffett do anything special? Does, it, does Warren, let me ask you this. Does Warren Buffett do anything different than you do when you go to the grocery store or when you go to a Walmart? Does he do anything different than you do at those places? Or have you ever gone to the car dealership? What do you do? Right? All you, at a car dealership, they tell you the price of the car, and you offer a lower price. Isn't that what Warren Buffett would do? What's his edge over everybody else? He's just smart enough to know that that's exactly how this works in the trading world. Okay? And he knows that he's, you know, anyway, let's move on. I, th I think I made my point, hopefully. Um, all right. All right, I'll start to look at, we're going to look at tons of charts. We're going to go over odds and answers. But I just want to set this up with a with a trade uh, took not that long ago, and again I'm going to show you the trades we took today and and last week and all that, and you're going to see the same picture over and over and over, okay? And, and uh, the picture is simply just buying at wholesale prices, selling at retail prices. But for you, the goal is to learn how to identify these wholesale and retail prices. So here's a chart of the Swiss, little five minute chart, okay? Little five minute chart. Down here, I identified this as a demand level. Why? Like we just learned, this is the origin of a pretty strong rally. Okay? Prices are trading sideways here. Strong rally ensues after that. Now, um, let me, I'm going to throw some questions at you, so please answer. It'll, I think it will help you. We'll make this interactive. Why couldn't prices stay here, and why did they have to rally away? What's the only reason? And I don't mean to talk to you like you're in kindergarten. I just want to make sure that you get this, because it really isn't that complicated. All right, exactly. Demand exceeds supply. Next question. Notice uh, when prices were in this little yellow shaded area, did, did price spend a lot of time there or just a little time? A lot of time or a little time here? 
and, and this is going to be a big point, yeah, very little time there. Again, the reason is because supply and demand are so out of balance there, right? Okay? So, again, uh, the more out of balance supply and demand is, the less time price is going to spend there. We're going to talk about that more in a few minutes. So the fact that price spent very little time here and then shot up away means that there's a ton of willing demand here. There's a lot of willing buy orders that did not get filled, way too many, okay? Oh, you guys aren't even looking at the chart, are you? Let me... Uh So I don't know if I clicked out of the new chart. All right. You should get it now. There you go. Okay. Uh, correct, Bastin. But, but Bastin, one of the things we do is we need to identify a fresh level. So we have a specific definition for a fresh level, and this meets that criteria. Okay. All right. So um, next, so, so given that uh, price spent so little time here and it shot away from this level, it's telling us demand greatly exceeds supply here, that's step number one. Don't forget step number two. Let's come back over here. When I push the buy button here for this little trade in the Swiss, who was I buying from? Who was on the other side of that trade? Was it a consistently profitable trader or a novice trader? In other words, uh, or keep it real simple. Were they? Ask yourself the two questions in the beginning. Were they selling after a drop in price? Mistake number one. Were they selling into a price level or demand exceeds supply? Mistake number two. If the answers to both of those questions are, are yes, and the risk here, again, we're entering the position at the top line with a stop below the bottom line, compared to the reward, which is the distance to the first target or the opposing supply level, um, if that risk-reward meets you know, the minimum criteria that you're looking for, you take the trade like a robot. Okay? Another way to say this is, okay, another way to say this, and then we'll move on, I simply bought at wholesale prices, from someone who's trained and conditioned to sell at wholesale prices. I simply sold at retail prices from someone who's trained and conditioned to buy at retail prices. Okay? Does everybody understand that? Okay. Am I doing anything different than Walmart does? I love being Walmart in trading. I love it. Okay? You want to be Walmart. We'll have to get, we have to make like big t-shirts and say, I'm proud to be a Walmart trader. No, I'm just kidding. You know, some of my examples and stories, I, I agree, are not that great. So if you, if you think of any better ones for me, believe me, I know I'm open. Send me an email. All right. You exit this trade at once every... Which is the opposing love question there. Okay? And we're going to get... We're going to get... Uh, we're going to take this deeper. Okay? Yeah, you did sell at the level above, uh, Mingus. That was where the profit was taken. Uh, Thompson, I, S.D. Thompson, I've seen you in here before. I want to make sure I get your question. Uh, yeah, so rally, base rally, and drop base rally, okay? Higher probability ones, first of all, you want to make sure that they're both fresh. And, and a lot of these things we're going to get to in the session here. Um, those those are rally, base rallies, like that one you just saw there in the Swiss, uh, they're fine as long as there's a significant profit margin with them, Okay. Uh, but obviously, the drop base rallies have you buying lower on the curve. Okay. Okay. Uh, Mickey, you can certainly set and forget. Um, you know, if if it's if it's a trade that's you know on a decent sized time frame, you know, and, you, and you're you're putting your order to buy at a deep discount demand level, you know, the seller there is probably going to be a novice seller, right? So so you don't you don't have to worry about that. Okay. Yes, profit margin, location on the curve is everything with that, with your original question there, okay? We'll try to get to the, I don't know if we get to the curve in this session, we'll try to, but we've got plenty of time uh, today and next week, all right? And remember, too, um, you know, what I'm trying to give you here today in an hour or two is something that, you know, we spend so much time on in the, uh, in the trading room and online trading center. Uh, we've got a lot of FX Street members in, in that, in that uh, as well. We, we can talk about that later, though. Let, let's keep plugging away here. Let me grab the next chart for you. It's time to fly. I find, and uh, never, never enough time. So uh, think back to our trading floor example, and uh, which is not, a, you know, it's, it's a real example. It happened every day. Um, but now we're, now we're looking at charts, okay? 90% uh, of the charts you're going to see are currency charts. This one happens to be the S&P, but it's the same concept. So now we're looking at charts. So, you know, I could not trade my own account on the trading on the on the trade desk because uh, it would have been free money. You couldn't lose, right? And that's because you know you have the orders. 
if you have the orders right in front of you, you know exactly where the significant buyers and sellers are. But when we come to a price chart, uh, there's a big piece of the puzzle missing. In fact, the biggest piece, right? We don't see the orders, okay? What we see instead, and, and Bastion, I think you were you were mentioned this before, in, instead we see lots of support resistance levels, lots of supply and demand levels. So how do we know which ones that we should focus on, which ones we should ignore? This is going to be, if you don't know it yet, this is going to be your biggest question mark going forward. How do you know which levels you should focus on and which levels you should ignore? Okay, to do that, we're going to dive into these things called odds enhancers. I'm going to give you a few of them here, and we'll uh, and we'll take it deeper as the day goes, you know, as, as our session goes along today. All right. So the first one, uh, in other words, uh, the purpose of what we're going to go this little exercise we're going to go through now is to is to clearly teach you how to identify price levels where supply and demand is out of balance in a very big way, and more importantly, to teach you how to identify price levels where it may look like a supply or demand level or support resistance level, but you know what? There's not a big supply demand balance here, so we want to ignore it. All right. Uh, so here we go. Uh, number one. Okay. First of all, on this chart, here is our supply level. Now, why do we call this a supply level? Because prices could not stay here and dropped away. Okay. But number one, how did prices leave the level? This is our first odds enhancer we're going to talk about. So notice prices gapped away from the level here. Now, we don't see too many gaps in the, in the Forex market, but we do on Sundays, right? And that's important. That's significant. So understand that prices can move away from this level in one of three ways. It can be a gradual move away from the level. It can be a stronger drop away from the level, maybe with big red candles. Or prices can gap away from the level. Out of those three choices, which one represents the strongest supply and demand imbalance? And just think your own logic through uh, – not a, not a difficult question. Yeah, the gap. So the rule in logic here is the stronger the move in price away from the level, the more out of balance supply and demand is at the level. Make sense? Okay. I'll grab the chart for you again. I see a couple people. See it? Number two, how much time did price spend at the level? Now, we already talked about this for uh, a few minutes, but let's do it again because it's important. Because this number two, when I talk to you about it, I'm, I'm actually giving it to you the opposite of how the textbooks give it to you. Okay? Think of it this way. So the, the, all, the, all the conventional technical analysis books out there, when they talk about support resistance, they say look for price levels on a chart where price spent, uh, you know, if you want to find key support resistance levels, look for, look for prices on a chart. Um, where, uh, you know, you have lots of trading activity, many candles on a chart, uh, where, uh, you know, where there's lots of volume, climactic volume, right? L look, look for areas like that. But if you think the logic through, I think you'll find that the opposite is true. Uh, Jack, yeah, we, we definitely go, go deeper, but uh, we're, we're certainly going to go over plenty today. Okay. Um, so, so now, you know, think the logic through, I think you'll find the opposite is true. Okay? And let me ask you this. At price levels in any market on the planet where supply and demand is most out of balance, are you going to get many transactions or very few transactions? Very few transactions, right, and that's because of the big imbalance. Now, at that same price level, you have the potential for the most activity, but the reason why you don't get it is because all that potential is on one side of the market, the buy side or sell side, right? Okay. So... Uh, so we all agreed that you get, you know, few candles and, 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 and uh, yeah, not a lot of activity. So, again, what's that picture going to look like on a chart? Is it many candles like the books say, or is it very few candles? It's going to be very few candles, right? Right? And what about volume? Is it going to be heavy volume or maybe lower than average volume? Right? It's probably going to be lower. Yeah. And, again, both of those things are exactly opposite of what the books say, but don't take my word for it. Just think the logic through, Okay? Uh, Bastin, no, not just a spike, because uh, that if you just go with that, you're missing a big component. That What you're saying right there with the big wick, um, that might already be a pullback into a level, so we wouldn't want to take that second time. But we'll go, uh, yeah, spikes are not the greatest. Uh, S.D. Thompson, very experienced there. Yeah, don't, uh, but, but hear me out again. We're going we're gonna to go through this, and I think you'll get it, okay? I just wanted to, you know, get on that question for you, because I don't want you just looking for those, Okay. All right, fresh levels, we'll get there too. Let's go with another one here. All right. 
take a look at this chart. Let's add a third one. So again, before we um, right, but that's but that spike because of the the, the pattern is is typic is often going to be a already a pullback into another level. Okay, but um, you know, again, inside those spikes, you know, let, let's say you have an hourly uh, spike that you're talking about. You know, I, I'm sure inside that on a five minute chart down at the turn, you're going to find a nice level that we're talking about. Okay, all right. Uh, okay, so let's look at this next one. Let's go through it. But again, before we focus on the chart, let's make sure we all understand and agree on the logic. So let me ask you this. Uh, let's say today you get to be on the trade desk and you get to trade your own account. It's going to be a free money day, and uh, you're all excited. Let's say you come in and um, and you're watching the uh, the euro. And let's say the biggest stack of sell orders above current price in the euro is at 137.50. Okay. Uh, that day, and you don't have any demand for quite a while, but that big stack of sell, you have a giant stack of sell orders, tons of supply at 137.50. Where are you, where are you going to feel comfortable selling short that day? 137.50, right? Okay. But let me, yeah, uh, but let me ask you this. Is there anything that would make you more comfortable selling short at 137.50? How about this? Let me, let me, let me uh, ask you this. How about if there was an even bigger stack of sell orders at 137.55? Would you now be more comfortable selling short at 137.50? Would you be more comfortable if you had an even bigger level right behind it? Of course we would, right? Okay, so what does that picture look like on a price chart? It's levels on top of levels. And it's subtle, but almost every trade that I'll ever show, and you'll see this later in a couple hours when we, uh, or in an hour or so when we get into the live markets, most of the ones that I'm willing to put my money at risk on have this levels on top of levels concept. It means it's just a strong opportunity. Okay? So look at the chart. Here we have our first supply level up here, rally base drop. Now this becomes a supply level when you have this big red candle that falls away. Just below it, we have another supply level, very few candles and a gap. We like that, right? That's good. So um, given that we have two levels on top of each other uh, that look pretty strong, Again, the question is, when I push the sell button here, who was I selling to? Okay, Was I selling to a consistently profitable trader, or was I selling to a novice trader who's buying after a rally in price and into that price level where supply exceeds demand? Okay, um, you, you know, yeah, the, the news was good, and there was a nice uptrend underway, but again, that's conventional thinking and conventional talk. talk. The fact is, prices are at retail levels, and when prices are at retail levels, we want to be the seller, okay? Uh, Adrian, yes, on, when price came back to here the first time, they were they were retracing into a, this was a fresh level. Remember, right here, if you're looking at this wick, this wick doesn't actually touch the level. So this was the first pullback into this area, all right? Now, there's a couple ways we enter this levels on top of levels concept, all right? Okay. Again, these are all trades that I just took, you know, in the either in the XLT or just in my own account. Um, let's take a look at another one. Let's add another odds enhancer. Hopefully, these are helping, and and hopefully uh, uh, you're starting to really get this. Okay. And again, we've got a second session coming up in a little while. It's a two. It's actually a three-part uh, series for us. Okay. Yeah, it's all about scoring the levels using the odds enhancers. Exactly, SD. Thanks for uh, helping out in the chat there. And uh, to some people, you're brand new at this. To other people, you've gotten some of this before. And uh, so Harley, um, yeah, you don't really need to use fibs with this method. Just follow price. Yeah, the reason why I wouldn't bring fibs into this, again, I don't want to just beat everything up, but uh, just, you know, I just want to kind of be just sit here and be honest with you uh, all day. You could bring, you know, Fibonacci retracement levels into this, but uh, think of it this way. You know, at the end of the day, you're always going to have, you know, three to five levels to choose from if you go with the fib route, right? Your, your question is going to be, okay, which one, which level do I, which price, which line do I use to buy or sell the retracement at, right? Well, the one you're going to choose, the one that's going to work, is the one that lines up with a real uh, level, a real supply and demand level, right? So then you'll start doing that for a while, matching them up, and eventually you're going to, you're going to say to yourself, well, if I'm only taking the lines to line up with the real levels, why do I need the lines, okay? Okay. All right, um, let me just make sure. Right, 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 okay, um, let's see. 
Let's let me go on here. One second. And let me grab the next one. Here we go. So this last, this next one, there's, there's this next one is, okay, um, number four. How far did price decline away from the level? before returning back to the level. So here's our supply level. This is the euro, okay? Here's supply level. This is euro. Again, this is the supply level because prices fall away from this level. So they move from right here to all the way down here. So the, the question for this one is, what is this distance? Is this a big distance or just a small distance, right? So how far did prices move away from the area before returning back to the level up here, which is where we push the sell button for this trade? And okay, this is where I sold short with a protective buy stop just above the level in case it doesn't work. Not every trade is going to work. Make sure you understand that. So that's the whole point of market timing, to get that low-risk trade. So we sold short right here. And again, um, now, what, now, now this odds enhancer that I'm showing you here hits on two things, probability and profit margin, okay? On the probability side, the farther prices move away from the area before returning back to the level, uh, that means that when I sold short here, I didn't just sell to a buyer who was buying after any old rally in price. I bought, I sold to a buyer who was buying after a huge rally in price, okay? Way up, in other words, that buyer who bought from me, they, they weren't buying low on the supply-demand curve. They, never, they weren't even buying near equilibrium. They were buying way up on the supply-demand curve where the odds are completely stacked against you, okay? Makes sense? And when you're, um, and on the profit margin side, when you're, when you're taking supply-demand levels, out at the extremes of the supply demand curve, you know, you're you're usually going to have big profit margins in your favor, okay? Jack's asking actually a good question. It's not, and I want you to know too, I'm, it's not like I'm picking some questions and skipping others. Um I'm just I look at the chart when I'm talking about the 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 you know, the points and then uh, and then afterwards I'll glance over the chat, but I did see an interesting question about uh that Jack asked. Uh Jack says, "How much does it have to move away?" from an area, uh, like as a rule, okay? That's a very important question. And here's something I think you really, really, really want to do. Uh, I'll explain it slow, cause, uh, but uh, here's the thing. So, so, so Jack or, or anybody, if you look at this chart, let's say that this supply level is, I don't know, let's call it, <clears throat> let's call it 20 ticks or 20 pips wide, okay, from top to bottom, okay? Say this is 20 pips, 20 ticks wide. When price starts to fall away from it, Make sure you, you hear me clearly here. This, when price starts to fall away from this area, this does not even become a supply level. Okay, I would not even call it a supply level until price is dropped at least. Let me get it. Until price is dropped at least 40 to 60 ticks or pips away. Does that make sense? Yeah, I wouldn't even call this a supply level then price, unless price has moved 40 to 60 pips away. Okay, then it becomes a supply level. All right. But just because it, you know, if it's a 20 pip range and then just drops 5 pips, 10 pips, I would never sell short against that, okay? I want the chart to tell me that a significant profit margin has opened up. Does that make sense? And let me carry that a little bit further because, again, today I want to take this session farther than we've ever taken it before. Um, but uh, let's say you're looking for opportunities that offer you 3 to 1. Okay, and Jack, since you asked the question, what do you what, what what's ideal for you? Are you looking for opportunities that offer you three to one, two to one? Uh, what what are you looking for? You tell me. Make it five to one, whatever you want. Three to one. Okay. So here's a little trick you can do uh, that's very important that can really help you. If you are looking to for three to one, okay, then I mean I'm saying if you want three to one profits. Right? If you want three to one payouts, find opportunities on the chart that are offering you at least four to one. Does that make sense? And then take your profits at three to one. If you're if you want two to one, make sure the chart is offering you three to one. You see, you see what I'm saying? Okay. Yeah, so Bastin, I see your last question there. So when price drops twenty pips away, you know, kinda of what does that have to do with it? it remember, we don't know this supply level here, before prices move away, maybe they rally from this level, maybe they drop. But before they move away from this level, how do we know what the what the order flow is in there? We don't see the orders. How do we know what the supply-demand relationship or equation is? We only know that after prices leave the level. We want to make sure it's a strong 
move away from the level that it goes at least, you know, two, three to one, whatever. Um, now, once prices move away, then we want to get back on the retracement. Because remember, the buyer who bought here doesn't realize, obviously, that they're buying into a price level where supply exceeds demand. Okay? Uh, okay. Oh, Baston, good question there, your last one. Because the further it moves away, now that, let's say it goes down to 37, 137, now, one third, now it has to travel 100 pips to get back to 138, right? Make sense, right? Obviously, you have to travel 100 pips to get to 138. So, so now you want to, you're going to push the sell button at 138, right? But now think about the person you're, you're selling to. Think about that buyer. They're waiting 100 pip. They're waiting for a 100 pip rally to buy. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you love to sell to people that do that all the time? And they happen to be buying into a price level where supply exceeds demand. You see my point? The fact that it drops to 137 or even better, 136.50. Now 138 becomes an even better level. They don't understand that they're paying ridiculous retail prices. They're not paying Walmart prices anymore. Now they're paying, you know, Macy's or Saks Fifth Avenue or one of those. Make, make sense? Okay. All right. Let's keep plugging away here. And uh, let me get to here. Okay. Hang on just one second, and then we'll go. Okay. Uh, here we go. Okay. So I just want to kind of quickly go through this, this little checklist here of odds enhancers. Uh, we've talked about some of these. How did prices leave the level? Okay. That helps us with the probability. How much time did price spend at the level? Again, that, that, uh, that, that, that tells us, you know, gives us a, a really good clue as to the supply-demand equation. Is there a profit margin, number three? Okay. Now, the reason uh, now number three there, okay, that's a deal breaker. If you don't have a significant profit margin, you don't have a trade, okay? Uh, in other words, this is very important, number three. You may have, you may have the best uh, supply and demand levels you've ever seen on a chart, but if they're too close to each other, there's no trade, okay? Think about Walmart. They probably, you know, people probably try to sell them stuff all the, every day, right? Hundreds of things. But what's Walmart going to pick? They're going to pick the things that sell, but number two, no matter how cool the product is, if they if it's if it's going to cost them five dollars to buy it, they can only sell it for five fifty or, or even five dollars. It's just a great product, but they're not going to they're not going to put it on their shelves, right? Okay, there has to be a profit margin there. In other words, find supply and demand levels on a chart that they're far away from each other. Okay, ignore the opportunities when they're too close. Like I said before, if you're looking for Three to one payouts, four to one payouts, five to one payouts on the chart. Let's say you're looking for five to one payouts on the chart uh, in the trade. Make sure the chart is offering you six or seven to one. Now it's going to make it that much easier to grab your five to one, right? Next one, trend. We certainly want to be trading with the trend. I didn't talk about that much here yet, okay? But in an uptrend, we want to buy, be buying pullbacks to demand levels and using supply levels as our targets. In a downtrend, we want to be selling rallies into supply levels and using demand levels as our targets, okay? We talked about number seven. We didn't talk about number six yet. Uh, we'll talk about that in, in a little bit, okay? And, uh, and I just saw we're at the top of the hour, and I'm, I'm uh, not supposed to go over my time here today, So, uh, but we're going to be back in an hour, I believe, uh, Vicki. Is that right? I believe we'll be back in an hour, okay? Yeah, and, and I really, really apologize if I missed uh, some questions uh, but certainly just, you know what, just if, you, if I didn't get to a question you really wanted answered, just uh, highlight it and copy it and, and paste it in on a Word document and then paste it back in here in like an hour and we'll get to it. Okay? Yeah, we're definitely going to finish the list. We'll start out the next session finishing the list and then we'll get into the live charts and go on from there. Uh, hopefully this is helpful and, uh, again, we're just getting started. So take a break and uh, we'll see you, I believe, in one hour. All right? Thanks for your time. This is all recorded. So we'll see you in about an hour.